here today. So uh, we'll get started here in just a minute. Welcome. We've still got some folks coming in uh, to the waiting room and there'll be some folks joining us. Great to see everybody. Um, so to get started, I would like to acknowledge that even though we are meeting virtually, this is the land, many of us are on the land of the unceded, uh, unceded ancestral lands of the Coastal Salish people. It's the traditional home of all tribes and bands within the Duwamish, Suquamish, Tulalip, and Muckleshoot nations. We recognize that the impacts of that history are still playing out today particularly today on Earth Day, as we recognize the land. I ask that we take this opportunity to thank the original caretakers. I also would like to acknowledge that this land acknowledgement does not take the place of authentic relationship with indigenous people. I offer this acknowledgement as a starting place. Thank you and welcome. So it is Earth Day. I hope you all saw our Earth Day announcement um, featuring the incredible work of SVP partner EarthGen. Um, be sure and check your inbox. It went out this morning. Uh, it's uh, really great to look and celebrate the work that EarthGen um, is doing. So uh, we have a couple of special guests here today, and um, I would love to uh, just have a quick announcement that um, Emiko Atherton, our executive director, will be hopefully joining shortly. She has been, uh, she was part of the Washington State delegation uh, welcoming President Biden uh, uh, in Seward Park as he signed an executive order also celebrating uh, Earth Day. It's an executive order protecting old growth forests. So we're really pleased and proud that Emiko was able to join that. She will be joining us as soon as she is able. Uh, in the meantime, uh, would like to just say a few words about advocacy. Some of you are joining uh, an advocacy group for the first time. Uh, Social Venture Partners has been undergoing a, a reimagining that literally started almost a year ago to the day, last spring of 2021. Emiko and the board launched the reimagining of SVP Seattle, building on our fundamentals and the blueprint of 25 years of success and continually challenging ourselves to do more to better center racial equity and live into reimagining philanthropy. As part of that reimagining, we have added advocacy as one of our programs. We are very early in our advocacy work. Um, I would like to recognize the work that uh, board members, uh, Ruby Love and Tali Rausch, as well as lead partner for United Indians of All Tribes, Terry Cole have done in helping to launch our advocacy work with an advocacy learning series and having bi-monthly uh, advocacy affinity groups. Um, we'll be following up with all of you and making sure you have invitations to those advocacy affinity groups. So do watch your inbox for that. So today, uh, we're excited to represent to welcome uh, State Representative Noel Frame and Dr. Carolyn Brotherton. First, we're going to hear from Representative Frame. She has served in the Washington State Legislature since January of 2016. She was moved to run for office by a strong commitment to fully fund public schools and fix our state's regressive upside down and unfair tax code. She was born and raised in Washington state. She's a former foster parent to two members of her own family. She is deeply committed to tackling the root causes of systemic issues facing families in crisis, such as eradicating poverty and increasing access to quality health care. Noelle works to give a voice to those who are often forgotten in public, in policy conversations, relying heavily on her nearly two decades of experience as an organizer to successfully navigate political systems. Noelle is the chair of the House Finance Committee and serves as co-chair of the Tax Structure Work Group. She also serves as a House, uh, as a member of the House Appropriations and Community Economic Development Committees. Uh, please join me in welcoming uh, Noelle Frame. Representative Frame, the Zoom is yours. Thank you so much. And um, thank you for that introduction. It's always kind of an awkward thing 
to be introduced. <laughs> so it's like, yes, thank you. That is my, my entire lived experience. So thank you, I appreciate that. Um, thank you everybody for being here today. Um, I think my recollection is I have about 15 minutes. And so I'm gonna kind of wonk out a little bit, but try to do it in a way that makes sense and then stop uh, and see what questions you all have. Um, so Heather, thank you for just teeing it up and explaining kind of that motivation for me. Um, and I think teeing off today, uh, really talking about the reason I do this work uh, is motivated by a fundamental truth, which is Washington state has the most regressive tax code in the entire nation. And what we mean by that is that we ask those with the least to pay the most, and we ask those with the most to pay the least. I think it's wrong. I think it's fundamentally unfair. Uh, it turns out most Washingtonians agree with me. And frankly, when you start talking about the specific policies to address it, most Americans agree with me too. Um, so when we talk about the, the code being regressive, there is a 6x difference in terms of the percentage of one's household income that they are paying in tax. It is six times, low income households are paying six times more than our highest income households. But that's talking about income. So when we talk about the top 1% of households in Washington state, we're talking income about a half a million dollars or more. And so when you stop and think about that's about income, it's not considering wealth. And we know that we have some of the wealthiest people in the world that call Washington state home. We know that the wealthiest people in our state are paying a fraction of a percent in taxes. Uh, and that has got to change. So last year, we took a big step, big first step in the right direction with two policies, the passage of the capital gains tax and the expansion of the working families tax credit. And I wanna to explain to you why I think it's not only like good policy from a matter of fairness, but it's good tax policy in terms of parity in the tax code. So prior to the passage of the capital gains tax, if you sold a home in Washington state, you paid a tax on that. It's called the real estate excise tax or REIT. Now with the passage of the capital gains tax, you pay a tax on a different transaction of a different kind of property, namely a sale or transfer of capital assets. And a subsection of those capital assets are financial and tangible property. We'll come back to that in a second. So in the same way you pay a tax on the sale of your house with the passage of the capital gains tax, you will now pay a tax on the sale or transfer of capital assets. On the Washington, uh, pardon me, on the working families tax credit, uh, which is an exemption to the sales tax, also an excise tax, just like capital gains, just like the REIT, um, for about 47% of Washington state's revenue is generated from sales tax. And we do exempt some key items from that, food, uh, menstrual products we added, we excluded from the base um, last year, or year or two ago. Um, but basically every other household good in Washington state is taxed. And so when you're a low income or even middle income household, that adds up really quick to be a pretty big chunk of your household income. So that working families tax credit is an exemption or credit against tax paid, namely the sales tax. So that first step was really trying to create parity in excise taxes and really trying to address fairness. So let's talk about fairness for just a second. Um, you know, Heather mentioned, um, I co-chair the tax structure work group. This is a bipartisan multi-year group that is bipartisan, bicameral, includes the governor's office, includes the Department of Revenue, as well as representatives from cities and counties. Um, and we are guided by the principles, kind of key principles in uh, taxes, uh, equity, um, stability, transparency. Uh, and when we talk about equity, what we really mean is fairness. We actually realized upon some reflection, that the word equity has a lot of meanings, particularly when you translate it to languages other than English. So we really focus on the concept of um, fairness. And through 14 tax town halls, 30 what we called go to you meetings, where we had our kind of team go meet with groups in their existing um, setting, um, focus groups in languages other than English, and a survey taken by thousands. We asked, how do you define fairness? Should fairness be based on one's capacity or ability to pay? Or is fairness about sort of consistency? It should be flat rates, so no matter what your income is, you're paying the same rate. Uh, well more than 50% of our participants said, ability to pay is the way that we should be defining fairness and that we should consider one's ability to pay when determining tax policy. Um, the other thing that I thought about a lot, and we've thought about in the terms of the tax code, 
The tax code in Washington state desperately needs to be modernized. <laughs> uh, it was largely written uh, in the late 30s and early 40s um, after a Supreme Court ruling you may have heard about when uh, the Supreme Court struck down a graduated income tax the, after the public, by the way, adopted it through ballot initiative. People always forget that detail. The public once upon a time did support a progressive income tax. Um, the tax code needs to be modernized. We've done very little uh, over the years to update it. A few years ago, we finally said, we're gonna apply sales tax equally to online sales as same as brick and mortar. That was a step in the right direction for modernization. As I really reflected on how to modernize the code, but also as a policymaker who is looking for the revenue to pay for the services that we need for our communities to be strong and vibrant. As I reflected on that, I landed at wealth because wealth concentration in this country has shifted dramatically. And if I am a policymaker looking at where to find money to pay for state goods, particularly as we're looking at other revenue sources declining, wealth is where it's at. And the combination of those uh, looking at fairness and looking at modernization, and frankly, just looking at parity, and I'll talk about that again in a second, in the same way I just talked about parity in the excise taxes. I landed at wealth tax and I introduced last year the Washington State Wealth Tax. So what is the wealth tax? That language is thrown around a lot. So let me say what we mean in Washington State, the actual proposal of the Washington State Wealth Tax. It's a property tax, plain and simple. Uh, so I mentioned parity earlier. So let's break it down again. If you own a home in Washington state, let's just say, even if you don't own it, if you're a renter living in a home, you pay property tax. You either pay it directly if you own the property or you pay it through your rent if you're a renter. That is real property. And we all pay 1% or more because of excess levies like school levies. We pay 1% on our homes. And we all know that homes have been the primary tool of wealth building for the middle class for generations in this country. I will note that is not a tool of wealth building that has been accessible to all Wash or American families as we have had deeply discriminatory policies against black members of our community and other communities of color and have proactively prevented them from owning homes and having a tool of wealth building, which is a whole nother day's conversation about the racial wealth gap. But if you think about that, we tax real property at 1%, primary tool of wealth building for the middle class. Whereas a different class of property, intangible property is fully exempted from the tax code, 0%. And financial property tends to be the tool of wealth building for the ultra wealthy. So to me, it's quite practical <laughs> that if we're paying 1% on our tool of wealth building, why shouldn't the ultra wealthy pay 1% on their tools of wealth building? Plain and simple. And that's what the Washington state wealth tax is. It is a flat, 1% tax on financial intangible property. And it is paired with an exemption. As you all know, we use exemptions all the time in Washington state's tax code. We have, as of 2020, 748 exemptions to the tax code. Not something I'm proud of, but it's a fact. So we added an exemption to this policy and said the first billion dollars of wealth is exempted. And you only pay 1% on that one billion and one dollar and above, plain and simple. And when we proposed that, uh, the, the, the estimates at the time were that Washington State had 97 billionaires that called Washington State home, not the three that we always hear about, not the five, not the 10, 97, and that that would generate the original estimates two and a half billion dollars a year in revenue, five billion per biennial budget cycle. We've revised those a little bit over the last uh, year, which I'm happy to talk about. Um, that's, a, that's a good chunk of money relative to our other revenue sources. And we could do some pretty exciting things uh, with that revenue. So the status, I introduced that bill last year. Not a coincidence that we heard that bill in the House Finance Committee where I'm the chair. <laughs> uh, but I convinced a majority of my colleagues to vote for it and we moved that bill out of committee. And then quite frankly, we decided as a community to prioritize passage of the capital gains tax and let the wealth tax sit. This year, uh, we had a fantastic hearing on the wealth tax in the Senate. Uh, truly incredible testimony, at least an hour, um, just really well-informed, broad set of stakeholders. Again, we decided not to move it this year for reasons, but I think we really elevated the conversation. 
Um, more than half of each of the House and Senate Democratic caucuses signed on as co-sponsors of those bills straight out the gate. That is not a small deal, including um, chairs of almost every committee, as well as senior leadership of uh, budget committees. Big deal. Um, right now, I'm going to say a couple more things, and then I'm going to stop because I really want to see what questions people have. The wealth tax is in the mix with the bipartisan tax structure work group. In our meeting in March, we voted on what concepts to move forward in the process to dig into more details and to maybe develop into proposals. And then we took some off the table. We took income tax, both corporate and personal off the table, but we did move forward the wealth tax, uh, a change to the growth limit factor for property tax, expansion of the working families tax credit, a primary residence property tax exemption and a comparable renter's credit. And then we also have some options on the business side. Um, basically replacing the business and occupation tax with something more rational and fair, uh, which will be, uh, we're looking at a, basically a modified gross receipts tax or margins tax. That's sort of the entirety of what's happening in the tax structure work group. As it relates to the wealth tax, my Republican colleagues have an opportunity right now to engage and support the wealth tax in a revenue neutral way if they so choose, they can partner with me to introduce that bill. It may not look exactly the way that I have it now and pair it with reductions so that it is not a net gain or a net loss to state revenue, but it's revenue neutral. They could choose to do that. We'll see what happens. Um, if they don't choose to do that, I certainly plan to still introduce the proposal, but how it's structured and where the revenue goes that we raise from it is an open question. I think there's a lot of us who are deeply interested in tackling the root causes of, as Heather said in my, my introduction, intergenerational poverty, and really addressing with key spending the things that prevent wealth building amongst our communities. For instance, increasing access to home ownership might be one example, particularly for communities of color who have been systematically disenfranchised from home ownership over generations. You see my point. There are real opportunities to take policy and have them shift fundamental change in our state. The last thing I will say, um, especially with President Biden here today, I could not be more thrilled to see President Biden having introduced uh, what he's calling the minimum billionaire income tax. It's not exactly the same as our proposal. There's definitely some um, overlap in the tax policy. Um, this is a national conversation that has been happening about a federal wealth tax, which I deeply support and would still like to see. But it's also happening in California, New York, Illinois, Minnesota, Hawaii, Massachusetts, and I could keep going. I just spent time on the phone this morning with a colleague in Illinois. We are building a national movement around this. It's time. It is time for fundamental economic and tax justice in this country. And I believe very strongly Washington state can and should be the lead. We are big, bold social and economic leaders. $15 minimum wage, sick and safe leave, paid family medical leave on social policy, legalizing same-sex marriage, legalizing cannabis. And frankly, on the private sector, we're a key leader in innovation. We can do this, we must do it, we should do it. I'm excited to be a part of that. I will put my last dying breath into passing this policy, but I sure would welcome your support and, and engagement uh, in leading that fight. So with that, Heather, um, I will stop talking, cough a little bit. Awesome. <laughs> look for some questions. Thank you so much. And I certainly hope it doesn't take your last dying breath. Um. I hope uh, not either. Let's be yes, clear. for you and for for all of us. But my goodness, um, thank you. That was fantastic. So, um, if folks want to come off mute to ask a question, or you can put questions in the chat um, for Representative Frame. Who would like to go first? Oh, uh, Terry, I think I see you coming off of mute. Yeah, I paused a second to see if anyone else was going to go. Um, Rep. Frame, I I have been following the tax structure group, and I'm not a financial kind of guru. If in our state constitution an income tax was not off the table, from a preference, an equitable fairness preference, 
where would that play in your proposals? Would it change your focus? So income tax is actually an option for us. Okay. It is, we could do a flat income tax today, no problem. Um, it, it is absolutely an option. And as we move towards some decisions in that March meeting, a flat personal income tax actually made it to the second to last round um, and was put up there. And even a flat corporate income tax got amended into the second to the last round. And then when we actually voted, it didn't have the votes amongst uh, the nine voting members of the work group. Um, there's a couple things I'll say about income tax. One, uh, I've had a lot of time to reflect on um, an income tax. And I, I, I think a number of us, if you haven't already read this book, you should, which is The Whiteness of Wealth by Dorothy Brown. Um, and I think that Dorothy Brown has been extraordinarily effective in convincing me that the federal tax code is fundamentally broken. Um, there are deep inequities baked into it. And if we were ever to do an income tax in Washington state, I would want us to do our own and start from scratch. I would not want to piggyback on the federal tax code. And in fact, I will tell you in the tax structure workroom town halls, I sat in uh, every time I alternated so I could be in the business breakout in one and the personal one in the other. I had business owners who I have no doubt agreed with me on absolutely nothing. We were not politically aligned, who said things like, it is not fair that Amazon pays $0 in federal taxes. And if you're gonna change the business taxes in Washington state, you've gotta make sure that they pay their fair share because I pay mine. Mm -hmm. And like, again, these were not progressives. <laughs> and so I think I've reflected a lot on like, if we were to ever go to an income tax, I'd want us to do our own and not piggyback, even though mm -hmm. that's harder from an administrative standpoint. Mm -hmm. um, the problem is it has been such a, it's such a deeply politicized issue that I, I thought businesses in particular would want a net receipts tax, AKA a corporate income tax because they hate the BNO tax so much because it's on gross and they wanted it, but they weren't willing to take a personal income tax with it, which is how we've ended up with this gross modified gross receipts tax. It's been deeply politicized. It's one of the most effective political weapons, frankly, the Republicans have against Democrats in Washington and it's not going away. Um, and frankly, I think the wealth tax is the better vehicle and actually gets at where revenue is um, in this country. Now I'm seeing questions pop up in the chat. This is fun. Okay, thanks, Terry. Um, I'm gonna leave it to you, Heather, to facilitate sure. if you do live Great. questions, or if you wanna do Great. you just let me know. Um, thank you. So um, just a quick note, uh, SVP is sponsoring, co-sponsoring, I should say, along with the Progress Alliance and the Washington Women's Foundation. Uh, a book event. We're welcoming Dorothy Brown um, uh, on May 16th. So we will follow up to everyone. Please join us. We're actually doing a book club, a number of us right now discussing the whiteness of wealth that Representative Frame you mentioned. So please do join for that book uh, event. So from Michael Tarlow in the chat, what about introducing baby bonds legislation for our state to help wealth inequality? And then also from Michael, why did the legislature allow the wealthy to opt out of the long-term care insurance tax? It will result in less funding realized. Great question. I'm going to try to be way speedier in answering the, these times. So sorry if I talk fast. The baby bonds, um, they were introduced this last year by Representative Stonier on behalf of the treasurer's office. They called it the Washington State Futures Fund. It did not pass, but what was included is a study on wealth disparities and whether or not the Washington State Futures Fund might be the right tool to address wealth disparities in Washington State. That study is underway. And in fact, Wash, um, as the chair of the House Finance Committee, I am planning to have work sessions this summer. Um, in June, I will have one on economic competitiveness uh, and how we define that. P.S. It's not the way that you might think. Second, in September, I'm going to have one on economic well-being of Washingtonians, and we'll have a report back on that study. Um, so that's coming. On the uh, Long-Term Care Trust Act, uh, your friend Noel has to choose her battles here. Um, and that a lot of times with payroll taxes, the state just mirrors what the federal government does on like social security. They cap it out at 137,500 and payroll taxes in the state tend to follow federal policy. Per my point that I wouldn't wanna follow federal policy and income tax, perhaps we should stop following federal policy on payroll taxes. There's work there to be done. So um, I agree that that's not really the right approach. Shall we keep awesome. going together with the written ones? Um, sure, yes. Yeah. So from Brad Brickman, is the proposed Washington State 
financial property exclusion of tax up to 1 billion typical of other states, it seems like a big deduction. I agree it's a big deduction. And um, I, you know, I really introduced it um, at that threshold and at the 1% rate really for simplicity, to, for people to really fundamentally understand the inequity. As I've spent all this time in the tax structure work group town halls over the last year, I got a lot of feedback that that threshold is too high and people want it to come down. And what we're seeing in the federal proposals and a bunch of other proposals across the country is 50 million, five zero. Um, and we've got the data to do a $50 million proposal right now. It's just a matter of changing the dials on the modeling. Um, I forget how much revenue that raises, um, but it's more than two and a half billion a year, as you might imagine. Um, and then I think we skipped one up above, Heather, one from Jonathan Kaufman. Or was it yeah, I can part? summarize. What keeps people from moving out of state? You got it. And Jonathan, I actually love how you worded your question. So here's my thinking. I mean, we, we have a ton of research that says that tax policy is not actually what motivates millionaires in particular. Um, from moving. That's just, there's tons of data around it. If you haven't read Cristobal Young's um, The Myth of Millionaire Flight, I strongly recommend it. Great read. And the bottom line of that is like, actually, the reason people make move places is for quality of life. The better thing that we can do is make investments to attract younger professionals that then root here, grow their wealth, and then tax it later to like reinvest it in the community. So that's sort of like one fundamental thing for us to think about. And I will just say, when I first introduced the bill, I mean, GeekWire introduced some billionaire tech guy that was moving his business to California, and they asked him point blank, if Washington State passed the capital gains tax and passed the wealth tax, would you move? And he's like, of course not. I just, I moved my family here and my company because of the quality of life and the talent pool, duh. So I think that those things are all the same, are all true. And it's hard not to have to address it when you've got people like Elon Musk doing what Elon Musk does, right? They're human beings, they're gonna do what they do. So to your point, there's two different things here for us to think about. One, work with other states so other states have comparable policies. So if they wanna be in a state with the talent that we have, with the investments, the community assets that we have, that doesn't matter where they go, they're gonna to have to pay their taxes. So that's sort of my thought process of coordinating with other communities. And then in terms of like Texas and Florida, here's what I would say. If you want to have a company where your workers can't, the, their workers, you know, can't get an abortion if they need one, if their workers want their trans kids targeted for living, be my guest, take your company to those states. I'm not going to, I'm not going to do a race to the bottom on taxes and compromise my values as a state. I think we win on our values. I think we win on our talent pool, our investments, on our natural beauty, no contest. So I say be my guest. Awesome. Well, thank Representative you. Frame, thank you. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you for all of your amazing work representing all of the people of Washington, as well as your constituents. Um, really appreciate your insight and wisdom. I hope, uh, I know you've got a very busy schedule today. Please, you know, stay on and uh, if you're able um, uh, for the rest of the program. Yeah. So next, yeah. I absolutely, thank you. I would love to welcome Dr. Carolyn Brotherton. Carolyn holds a BS in chemistry from Yale and a PhD in chemistry and chemical biology from Harvard. Uh, she is currently with the Economic Opportunity Institute where she works as a government relations, pardon me, uh, where she focuses on, on tax policy. She is also uh, was the government relations specialist with AFT Washington, and she got into advocacy while helping to organize a union and negotiate a first contract for fellow postdoctoral researchers at the University of Washington. She interned with the Washington State Labor Council during the 2019 legislative session. And again, she focuses on taxes and higher education policy at EOI. Dr. Brotherton. Thank you for that intro. I'm so happy to be here. It's so great to see Representative Frame who I love to work with. And I'm gonna share screen here. Let me see if I can full screen it. Is it full screen for you? Okay, perfect. Okay, let me hide that. All right, so hello everyone. Um, it's great to be here. Exciting to hear that you are starting a advocacy group within Social Ventures. Um, 
we need everyone involved in making change because there's a lot to do. Um, so I'm Carolyn Brotherton. I'm from the Economic Opportunity Institute. I'm in Seattle. And I'll just be talking about why we need to tax extreme wealth so we can build thriving communities. So as you may or may not be aware, we have a wealth inequality problem in the United States that's only getting more extreme. Uh, for the first time uh, since they've been collecting this data, the Federal Reserve reported in late 2021 that for the first time ever, the top 1% of American households hold more wealth than the entire middle 60% of American households. So this graph uh, has the top 1% in orange and the middle 60% in green. And as you can see, this isn't just the top 1% catching up with the middle 60%. It's actually, actually the middle 60% is losing out. And a lot of that is because of uh, rising debt and the fact that our tax systems and our economic and political systems are designed to encourage wealth inequality. So I'll talk a little, a little bit about that. Unfortunately, this isn't just a theoretical concept. There's actually real material consequences for the growing inequality in our country and in our state. Um, so as you may be acutely aware, the pandemic has shown a really bright light on existing problems in our society. And it's not just made them more you know, clear to us, but it's actually made those problems worse. So on this slide, I just have a few of the uneven COVID impacts we've seen in Washington when it comes to housing, food, health, and security. So around half of Washington households were rent burdened before the pandemic, which means that they're spending more than 50% of their monthly income to pay rent. And now the US Census Bureau Pulse Survey uh, shows that uh, more and more households uh, are facing threats of eviction and foreclosure. And if you live in Seattle, like I do in many parts of our state, the um, home homelessness crisis, people living outside, it's gotten really, really extreme and it is a humanitarian crisis. Um, in addition, food insecurity has also increased. A third of Washingtonians surveyed in 2021 were experiencing food insecurity up from 10% before the pandemic. And finally, in 2021, the Kaiser Family Foundation survey saw that one third of people reported not taking medication that their doctor had prescribed because of the high cost. So wealth inequality is increasing. It's not just a theoretical thing. We actually see that everyday people's quality of life is going down and people are having to make choices between paying for uh, different basic needs because they just don't have the means to do so. And the government programs and services that might be there to help them just simply are not there. So turning now to Washington, I wanna talk a little bit about how our tax code isn't just unfair, but actually perpetuates austerity in the long run. So as Representative Frame um, said really clearly, our state tax code is the most unfair in the country because we ask those with the least to pay the most in proportion to what they can. It is the opposite of fair. And it's kind of ironic because we're also one of the wealthiest states in the country. Um, so I want to give a little bit of background about how our reliance on the sales tax in particular leads to creating a structural investment deficit. So um, the sales tax is on goods that people buy. And over time, the amount of revenue our state is able to um, raise from that tax is not keeping up with the growth in our state in terms of population, in terms of state personal income, and in terms of other types of ways you measure growth. And that's for a couple of reasons, but one is that people are just spending less on goods and spending more on things like services and other things in our economy. And as Representative Frame said, we also have a really outdated tax code. And so in other ways, um, our tax code isn't raising revenue that keeps up with the ways that our economy is changing, the ways that people grow their wealth differently. And in general, it's just not keeping up with the growth in our state, and no matter how you measure it. And so over time, because we have this declining uh, levels of revenue raised over time, we also have a direct connection to declining levels of state spending over time. So this graph shows us total state, total state spending in that purple line at the top and total state spending on K through 12 education in that orange line. And you can see from the mid 1980s to today, 
relative to the um, amount of total personal uh, income in our state, uh, state spending has been declining. And so the definition of austerity is asking um, organizations, uh, people, programs to do more and more with less and less. And that is actually exactly what our state is, is setting up when we have a tax code that creates this, this situation. So um, essentially, our tax code is at the core of why we keep not being able to do some of the really big things we know we need to do to make a difference in people's lives. Um, it is connected to the, the tax code structure. Um, so without rambling more about that, I'm gonna go to my next slide. So as we're going into the next year, we have an amazing opportunity because of the work of the tax structure work group that um, Representative Frame is the chair of, and just momentum right now. Um, a lot of advocates are seeing the impacts of the pandemic in their communities and not seeing um, the support that we need to um, really succeed. There's a growing movement to say, you know what? There's a lot of resources in our state and it's about time we reform our tax code so that we're using those resources to fully fund programs, to provide for the things that make a difference like childcare, like safe schools, like public health, uh, and so on and so forth. So there's a movement to change our tax code and change the ways that our state spends. At the front of that movement in this moment is really the state wealth tax on the ultra wealthy. Representative Frame went over this really well, so I won't go into too much detail. But just to remind you, the way that this is designed is that it's a 1% property tax on financial and tangible property, such as stocks and bonds. So as Rep Frame already mentioned, unless you sell stocks and bonds, um, these assets are not taxed at any level of our federal, state, or local tax systems. Um, and it's not just unfair, it's actually just leaving a lot of resources on the table that could be much better spent, you know, doing things like paying childcare workers a living wage or making sure that school buses get to school on time and are able to safely deliver students. Um, right now, the way the policy is designed is that the first billion is exempt, but um, I think that is a dial that we should look at changing. It's really important to mention that it is completely consistent with the Washington State Constitution, which if you're a nerd, you might know that there's a lot of constraints in the Constitution on how we tax property. And Representative Frame already mentioned, this would impact a very small number of taxpayers. And even if we lower the threshold to $50 million, it's still um, very few uh, folks in our state. And these are folks who are very, very lucky and very privileged to say the least. Um, so this is a really exciting policy, and um, I'm happy to talk more in detail about how it would work and some of the questions people often have about it. But I would be remiss not to mention, just to kind of double down on what Rep. Frame said, we're part of not just a state movement for tax justice, but also a national movement. And so California and New York have some of the most um, uh, the, some of the bills that were covered most in the media, and they're really exciting. Right now, California has a bill that's moving through the legislative process. And you can see in that photo on, um, I guess it would be your left, um, that this proposal is sponsored by Representative Alex Lee. You can see him smiling in that photo because he's probably really excited to be a part of this. Um, and then we also have the national movement. So the Biden administration in their new budget did propose a billionaire minimum tax. And there's just more and more of an awareness that um, we have a we have a dividing we have a dividing country in terms of the haves and have nots, and the haves are getting really really wealthy at a rate that is astronomical and actually kind of impossible for us to understand. So America's for tax fairness reported that America's billionaires are two trillion dollars richer since the pandemic began. Um, there was a Harvard survey that was done, um, I believe, in the summer of 2021 that showed that. Over 40% of American households have completely extinguished their savings um, and other sort of uh, really scary statistics about how the middle and bottom 60% um, of Americans are doing. Um, short answer is not well. So there's a lot we need to do, but it's we're in really good company when it comes to pushing for a state wealth tax. And so um, I have a couple of next steps for you. Um, as you get into advocacy, you might learn that 
Um, you should never uh, end a meeting without having an action item. And so my action items for you are first, um, we have rolled out a petition for a state wealth tax in Washington. I'll drop it in the chat as soon as I can. And we would love for you to sign this. It's basically saying, hey, lawmakers, um, make this a priority going forward. And here's why. We have so many needs in our communities. We've got resources on the table. Let's do the pragmatic practical thing for our state, reform our tax code, tax the ultra wealthy, and you know, fully fund the government programs and services that mean that our communities can thrive. So that's what the petition says. And then I would just encourage you to get involved with this movement um, at any level that feels right to you, whether it's signing petitions, you know, uh, going to meetings with your state lawmakers that they might be holding, such as town halls, and elevating this issue. Um, we do have the legislative session that will be in 2023, and that's an awesome opportunity to testify or sign in and support of bills that matter to you. Um, so yeah, get involved in ways that feel right. And one way to get involved is to get involved with EOI. Uh, we have an amazing Changemakers Dinner um, this year on September 15th, and we have a variety of social media platforms that you can follow. If you find us on our website, we um, have an amazing a newsletter that we send out every two weeks and we put a lot of great information in there and that's a good way to keep up to speed. So um, that's it for me and I'm going to put the petition in the chat. So just give me a moment to grab that and then yeah, you can take questions that you might have. There's I one. Have, like, oh. I to Bye. I'm so sorry. <laughs> Thank you everybody. Thank you, Representative Frame. Bye. Heather, there's a question in the chat box. Great. And I believe Emiko, I see Emiko and her, uh, her sidekick Pippa have joined us. So um, I'll kick it off with the first question and then turn it over to Emiko to uh, uh, facilitate the rest of the conversation. From Andrea John Smith. This is exciting. I appreciate all of your work on this, especially excited about the national trend and worried that we will not have majorities to make it happen. Who are the main, who are the main organized opposition? So you're worried that we won't have the majorities to make it happen in the state legislature or in Congress? Just in Congress, just, that, that in was... Congress. Yeah, just a lament. Yeah, not not yeah. worried about Washington, but yeah, nationally. Well, you know, I think that's good because, um, like many areas in our society where Washington was a leader, and then other states caught up, and then the, the federal government caught up. I think the wealth tax might be another one of those areas. So I think for now, our focus should be on winning in Washington, and um, I can't really speak to the likelihood of Congress doing this. You know, they've had on their plate a lot of a really great legislation, such as the PRO Act, Build Back Better, and that hasn't happened, even though there is a Democratic majority. So um, I think right now the, the effort uh, should be focused on Washington, because I think we have a winnable fight here. Um, and I also think that in terms of how um, in terms of how changes happened in the past, um, it started in the states. So this could be another one of those areas. In terms of who is the main organized opposition, um, right now in Washington, um, you know, we have this amazing hearing in the Senate that Representative Frame mentioned. Over 2,500 people signed in in support of that bill. We had a ton of people sign in to testify. There was all of, uh, you know, I think out of 2,500 people who signed in pro, in addition to that, there was, you know, less than 300 people who signed in against. Um, so it's not really an organized opposition at this point. I think it's more just dealing with kind of the entrenched power structures that we deal with um, that are a little bit more behind the scenes at this point. So I, I wouldn't say that there's this big, bold opposition to a state wealth tax. Um, and I think one reason is because when you delve into it, you kind of realize that it is a practical, pragmatic policy um, that, we should, that we should probably just do. Um, so it's kind of hard to be against it. I would say also the polling that we've done in the state on the wealth tax and the national polling 
shows that this is really popular across political party lines, across geography, across education levels. It's definitely a populist issue um, because people understand deeply um, that you know there is this divide happening and that it's affecting their 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 lives and their families' lives. So that's what I'll say about that. And I put the petition in the chat, so please take a look at that and sign on if you support this. Right, and hello, Emiko Atherton here. Apologize for uh, dialing him and I could hear most of it, but couldn't see. Um, it looks like we have another question in the chat box, which is, have any of the 100 identified super wealthy in our state gotten on board with this? You know, that's a great question. Um, so not that I know of, no one has come out, you know, like um, Mackenzie Scott, for instance, we haven't seen her publicly support this. Um, I know that in New York, they um, were working closely with a group called Patriotic Millionaires, and they did have the support of Abigail Disney um, in New York for their wealth tax. Um, I think this comes down to a theory of what your theory of change is. Um, I don't think that we need to ask permission from people who hold power. Um, as Franklin, Frank, Franklin Douglas said, uh, uh, power concedes nothing without a demand, right? So I think that we have to say, what is our demand? Our demand is that, you know, we tax extreme wealth so that our communities can have things like, you know, affordable childcare, safe schools, and so on and so forth. I would love for the billionaires in our state to come out and support this. I'm not holding my breath and I don't think our success depends on that. Um, so yeah, but it would be lovely if they did. Uh, and I would think that some of the uh, billionaires in our state might well do that because they, many of them do have a very strong um, sense of giving back. And um, I think this might speak to them. So we'll see. Great, thank you. Um, if anyone has any other questions, I have a question, but I'll reserve it for if anyone else in the audience, uh, feel free to put it in the chat box or just come off mute. Um, but maybe as people think about their next question, I'll ask you a question, Carolyn, uh, and preface it with, because um, you're probably not as familiar with SVP as some others on this call, but we're a nonpartisan 501c3 of really donors and or what we call our partners and community partners um, that are interested in really creating thriving communities where uh, everyone can thrive, but particularly those who have been systematically underrepresented and underinvested in. And um, so I think, you know, first and foremost, although probably a lot of people here identify with certain causes or a political party, um, you know, we, we are showing up here as donors and community partners, nonprofits interested in working together um, really, you know, in support of racial and social justice. And so I preface that all to say, you know, we, we are a collective of donors and nonprofits. And what do you think, you know, is there a unique role that this group could play in helping um, support something like this? Because it is to me, you know, right in line with we're interested in, you know, creating thriving communities for all. Um, but we're, you know, we're not an advocacy, we're not, we are not an issue advocacy organization, but I think there's a lot to be said about our collective strength together, particularly because we're a pretty diverse, we're a diverse group of, I think where we, our lived experience, our political parties, our education, our background, where we're born and where we grow, where we grow up. And, you know, any, any specific call to action to this group beyond signing the petition. Yeah, so that's, you know, that's fantastic. And that's why I was so excited to speak to you all today, because I think one thing that's really exciting about working on uh, revenue policy, tax policy, is that how we raise money and who we're asking to pay taxes impacts every single advocacy area in the state. So whether you care about public schools, public health, um, behavioral health, the housing crisis, it really touches all of those. And right now, as I already mentioned, our tax code is holding us back. It really bakes in austerity into the process. So I think that tax revenue is actually a great like hub for bringing together advocates from different issue areas. Um, you know, there is the Balance Our Tax Code Coalition, 
which is a coalition of advocacy organizations, labor groups, uh, food security groups. If you're part of an organization, that is a great coalition to join. Um, and you are, you are uh, free to reach out to me and I will connect you with their executive director, Emily Parzibach. I work closely with Balance Our Tax Code. I go to all their meetings. Um, that is a coalition that's existed for a while and they were really instrumental in getting the capital gains tax pass. So I really recommend Balance Our Tax Code. Um, I think in addition, if you're not part of an organization and you're just an individual who wants to make a difference, um, you know, I think that if you're a person who is an, an influential person in your community, uh, you can meet with your legislators, they'll meet with you, and you can raise this as an issue that you're concerned about. And when uh, legislators are hearing from constituents the same message over and over again, that really does make a difference. Um, if they're hearing it from people that they didn't expect to hear it from, that makes it an even bigger difference, right? Because a lot of times legislators, you know, they'll see the same people advocating for the same thing for years and years and they, they stop listening. So I definitely think that the more we can raise this in conversations with lawmakers, uh, the better. I'll just put this out there. Um, we're a non-endorsing organization, EOI, we're nonpartisan, um, but there is a big election year ahead of us in Washington state. Um, the entire House of Representatives is running and I think a lot of the Senate is too. I don't track it super closely because I don't work on campaigns, but there's a lot of opportunity to get legislators talking about this as they're running, right? So I think there's a huge opportunity um, uh, just to like really just talk about it in the next year. So that those are a few action items, balance your tax code, raising conversation. If you're part of an organization um, that has a legislative agenda, put those state wealth tax on your legislative agenda. Um, put tax reform at the top of your agenda. Um, those are a few. I could name a few more. I think those are good first steps. Um, and yeah, I'll, I'll stop there if that helps and you go. Okay. I think that uh, that's great. Does anyone else have any other questions right now? I know we're almost at time. Uh, well, I want to say like just a big thank you, Dr. Brotherton, super interesting and informative. Um, and it was a pleasure to have you. So just a big thank you. Um, thank you so much. Yeah, and, and we hope we can continue this conversation. To SVP partners, I'd say like this, you know, our, our, our advocacy journey is about inviting things going in that we might be interested in. Um, this, I, I really have to credit Tally Rausch, one of our board members who got this going, um, because this is something she cares a lot about and believes that the partnership should be interested in. We are really in a phase where we're learning about issues that we think we can have a difference in and that we're interested in exploring. Um, so what I'd say is like, come to the net, we're going to talk about this. Does this resonate with us? Is this something we want to take action on? I think it's really important for us to, um, to, you know, expose ourselves to the issues that our community groups are interested in and asking in and saying, is this, you know, should we have a lot of collective power together? And, you know, how, how do we choose to use that? What does it mean for a donor group, really a donor organized group to be um, it's taking, taking a step forward in advocacy. So just big thank you. Um, come, we should have one next, just a regular meeting next week where we can debrief on this, talk about next steps and generate ideas for other speakers we want to have come. So just big thank you, Carolyn. We'll make sure, um, this was recorded, I understand. So we'll make sure we'll share this out. And, um, uh, Carolyn's information. I also see Heather put a comment. I know The Whiteness of Wealth um, was a book that was referenced um, by Representative Frame. Um, we're co-hosting a discussion with the author in a few weeks, so you can sign up with that. Um, and it'll be really, really, I have been reading the book and it's been really eye-opening. I actually didn't know a lot about, I thought I knew a lot about it, um, and I really did not. Um, and Moses, I see a question for you, from you. Yeah, just a quick question um, for Carolyn and um, and really anybody else that would that might know. You know, with this tax, uh, first of all, my name is Moses Perez. I use he/him pronouns, and I'm with Open Doors for Multicultural Families. So we serve uh, bi BIPOC families uh, primarily who 
um, have loved ones with intellectual and or developmental disabilities. And so with that said, you know, taking this back to our organization, um, to our staff, our leaders, as well as our families, especially the families and individuals we serve, um, I already know one of the top questions will be like, okay, what's, so if this, if this does go through this wealth tax, how will that money be spent? Um, I heard about schools and I'm a big proponent of schools, but I also know that, you know, more than half of our budget goes to schools. So I'm not sure if it's that they need more money or more efficiency, it's probably both, right? But um, specifically, how will this money, you know, impact our communities? Um, many of the families that we serve not only struggle with the color issue, they struggle with racism, but they also struggle with ableism because of either their disability or the disability of their loved ones. And so, you know, how, how will this wealth tax really help to even out the playing field? There's gonna, is there gonna be foundational grants for them to go to college, to help families? Um, I'm, I'm just wondering, you know, like, so if the community backs this, what's, what's the assurance, right? That our priorities are gonna be prioritized and um, because as many bills gets, you know, many times people come to the community and ask us to help them pass a bill. But and then when the bill becomes a law, that's usually when they're like, OK, bye bye. You know, we'll see you again in two or three years. And they're not really involved in the implementation of actually how that in, that that money gets actually distributed for the majority of bills. So that, you know, we passed a bill this year for language access in public schools because it was one of our top priorities for our families. But we made sure that in the bill, once the bill passes, that money is um, allocated to ensure that a community advisory committee will be there to hold those entities accountable uh, to do what they said they would do with that money. And I, I just don't see a lot of, too, you know, I don't see too many of those examples out there. So I just wanted to ask that. Thank you. Yeah, that is such a great question. And thanks for sharing your experiences um, with, with that funding issue you're talking about and accountability. Um, so I'll just start with the fact that our state has been practicing austerity for decades now means every time we are in a budget season, we pit advocates and communities against each other for crumbs. That is what happens. And so it becomes this fight about resources um, when really that should not be the fight that we're having, but it's I want to be realistic. It is, it is a it is a dynamic, right? Where it's like, okay, we're raising money. What do we spend it on? Who gets who gets the, the prize, you know? And the fact that that's the system we have really undermines our sense of solidarity with one another. And the fact that we're all in this together and that it's at some level, it's impossible to prioritize issues because there's so many things that are equally important, but you're totally right. Like, I think that um, as we talk to people about this, one of the first questions we often get is, okay, that's great, but how are you gonna spend it? Where is it going to? And is my community gonna feel the difference? Um, so right now, the way the bill is written um, was a, a, a bill that was introduced in 2021. In the next year, we're going to be working, uh, myself, Representative Frame, and we're trying to build out a big coalition of folks to really strengthen the bill through the interim and introduce a new version next session. I hope to see in that version a much lower exemption threshold so we can raise significantly more money than two and a half billion dollars. Right now, the California proposal, I believe it raises something like $20 billion a year. And so you stop having the conversation about, is my community going to feel this? Because you're not in that um, um, limited mindset. You're in, a, you're in a prosperity mindset, right? Of like, yes, we can do all of the above. So I think that would be where I would first want to go with this legislation is say, we need to lower the threshold because ultra wealthy starts much lower than a billion dollars. And then we really need to have a conversation about, okay, is this going into the general fund? Is this going into a dedicated fund? How do we make sure that this is going towards things that are going to make a difference and that people who are part of this coalition are having their priorities met? But I would say at this point, there hasn't been a dedication to it. It hasn't been dedicated to public schools, public health, behavioral health, or any of that. And that is still a big open question. My ideal scenario would be that we don't have a dedicated fund um, and that we can um, 
get out of this mindset of um, pitting communities against each other um, by just going to a place where we can do a lot of big things at once. I mean, one thing that I'm personally really jazzed about is what New Mexico is doing with tuition-free community uh, and four-year colleges. Um, you know, there's lots of different types of programs we can do um, that would make a really big difference. So I don't want to- I add something, yeah. Carolyn, before we go? Just to say, you know, um, I think there's also multi-processes that will have to happen, that can happen even whether this wealth tax passes or not. I agree, as a policy person, I don't want to see this dedicated to one specific thing because there's so many needs in the state. So let's get the money in there. And then on the other end, you know, how do we improve implementation efforts, which some state agencies are really getting better and better about. They just funded lived experience that can actually pay people for their time to participate in these processes to um, make the behavioral health better, foster care, um, even child care, so that you're starting to see that. So I think it's multi-prong approach where let's get the money in there um, and let's improve our processes and accountability and transparency for how the dollars are spent. And Moses, I'm happy to talk more um, about what we're doing to that and uh, to kind of push state agencies. Yeah, yeah, I, I'm I'm aware of that. I really appreciate that work that's going on to to really value um, advocates, especially family and parent and self advocates, as subject matter experts, as opposed to just you know uh, uh, less you know kind of second thoughts. I thank you, Carolyn, for that answer. Um, I I do want to push back just a little bit and say I didn't want to sound like. Um, it, you know, what is that going to do for, for our specific families? Because, I mean, that's what I think about absolutely all day. But my point is, like, there was a lot of research that went in to present your case on why this wealth tax is a good thing. And I agree with it. But I would really like to see those same resources put on the back end to say this is how the money is going to be spent. And this is how it's going to shorten the, the, you know, it's going to help to, um, uh, how do I say, uh, lay, uh, level the playing field. And here's our, here's our statistics, here's the money, you know, here's the research we've done. And once that money goes into the general fund or goes into this fund or that fund or wherever it goes into, this is how it's gonna lay, level the playing field. Cause then we can, we can present that to our community members and say, hey, we need to get behind this. Even if it's not going for disability or for BIPOC communities or whatever it is, but, this is how it's going to level the, flame, the, the playing field, because that's what we're saying the issue is. They're way up here and we're down here. Well, how is this going to help, you know, you know, shorten that gap uh, or that chasm, right? <laughs> yeah, I, I think your, your points are really well taken that you would like to see a little bit more emphasis on the research and data in terms of how, if we were to pass this, um, like how would having those revenues infused into our state budget actually um, make a dent in uh, racial equity, gender equity, disability equity. That's what you're. That's what you're calling for, and I think that is absolutely spot on. And I, I hope to do some of that research, but I am just one person, and I'm a little bit more on like the the upfront side of it. But I think that is just another reason why every time we're talking about taxes, we need to bring it back to what are the things we want, what are the things we're trying to build, because that's what motivates people. And you're absolutely right about that. And I'm sorry if I like uh, misrepresented your words. I didn't mean to do that. Um, but no, yeah, it, that's it, a great it, point. I appreciate that. And it, it's really um, because it's harder to ask for that money later or to get them to spend that money in these particular ways later once they get the money. And I'm saying they, but entities, the you know, whoever's going to get it. So yeah, it just uh, that's what that that's one of the things that our families always ask us is like, not just how is it going to impact them and their family, but how is it going to impact our community as a whole, our city and our state. So thank you. Well, thank you all. This was a really uh, great, robust discussion. Uh, and it was I look forward to continuing it next Friday. So Heather, um, we'll make sure to send out a link, but it looks sunny which is, um, it just feels like it hasn't, I'm sure it happened like a week ago, but when it gets gray here, it feels like it's a lifetime. So I hope everyone gets to go enjoy the sun. Thank you again, Dr. Brotherton. Thank you everyone for showing up. Uh, and let's keep continuing this conversation and how we can turn conversations into action uh, next week. So I'll see you all soon.